Hi, so um, I'm going to continue with part two of my lecture on the performing arts at National Park Seminary. And in this particular case, I also have a co-presenter, Elizabeth Darby, who is a member of SOS and also, as do I, live on, um, lives on the campus. And she'll be presenting um, a section of the talk. So it'll start with me, then Elizabeth, and then I'll come back and, and finish up with um, some other information. Um, the first probably 10 slides you will have seen before if you attended the first lecture, but I thought they were worthwhile repeating to give everybody a sense of the campus and of what actually happened in terms of uh, instruction here on campus. <clears throat> so the performing arts at NPS, there were three primary things that were taught, uh, music, drama, and dance. Um, in the music section, they always had some instrumental uh, lessons teaching, it was usually violin and piano <clears throat> and organ. Occasionally they had harp um, and sometimes mandolin and guitar. Uh, the voice was always sort of solo singing and choirs. Um, and then for drama, it began with, in the early part of the school, by calling it elocution. Drama was one of those words that was not very well received by upper class uh, people at the time. Um, and so these courses were called elocution courses, but by the time the school closed in the late 30s, early 40s, they were calling it dramatic arts at that point. Um, they also had instruction in movement and um, things about written plays. And then as far as dance goes, they always had someone on staff who taught dance. Um, in the early years, it just said dance. And later on, towards the end of the school, um, it started to mention tap and ballroom specifically. And then this is a shot of the Odeon Theater that was uh, from about the 1920s. It was built in 1901, but the photo is from uh, about 1920-something. Um, showing it as it was up until 1927 when um, the music hall was built and attached to the side of this. Uh, the ballroom was over here on this side and this is what was known as the scenery wing. And then um, as you all probably know, this is no longer here. This burned down in uh, 1993 in September. Um, this was the interior of the Odeon. It was the first electrified building on campus and seated about 500 people. Um, so moving on to coursework. Um, I kind of, in the original talk, I had looked at three different periods of the school era, sort of 1910, 1920s, and then the end of the school era, 1930s, 40. Um, elocution. Um, there were 11 courses at the beginning, including at Del Sart, and we'll get to that in a moment. This will be what Elizabeth will be talking about um, in singing courses. Then they added dramatic arts. They were getting more comfortable using that word um, in the 20s, and there were eight courses. And then in the 30s, 40s, uh, there were, it was called dramatic arts, um, and there were eight courses, including one that involved radio broadcasting. So they got rid of Del Sart. Um, and moved up to uh, this radio broadcasting. And as far as music went, um, they had pretty much the same number of courses throughout the entire um, period of the school in voice. And for instrumental, they always had, as I had said before, piano, organ, um, violin, and I guess theory courses. And those also stayed pretty constant throughout the, the, the school period. They had off and on harp, uh, off and on um, orchestra, so. And the degrees they offered, uh, they started at the beginning in order to elevate, I think, um, the degree. It was always combined with literature, so music literature degree or elocution literature degree, and then by the end, they, were, they had a simple um, music degree and a dramatic arts degree. And this is a copy of the catalog that came out every single year, um, was distributed to students um, so they could see um, information about the school, what they were expected to do during the school year, and it also gave a list of courses and, and instructors for those courses. 
Um, and so for 1911, here is a list of, of instructors for various courses, and the top two, um, Emma Ostrander and Mary Townsend, were the uh, dramatic arts and elocution teachers. And you'll see here with, for Mary Townsend, dramatic art, Del Sart, and voice drill. And so in order to give you a good idea of what Del Sart is, of what it was, uh, and what it still is, actually, um, I will move to my co-presenter, Elizabeth Darby, who will um, give some information about that. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, as Chris said, my name's Elizabeth, and uh, I uh, am a relatively new resident here. I've been here almost a year now, but I still feel new. And I am an actor by training, and Chris got wind of that and invited me to uh, participate in this talk. So I watched the YouTube video from last year and came across the name Del Sart, which I had never heard of in, my, in all my acting training. I had never heard of him. Uh, but I understood, uh, I think from what you said, Chris, that he um, had a sort of gestural approach to acting. And I'm a big fan of uh, physical theater. I've had some training in Commedia dell'arte and other traditional forms of sort of physically based acting. So I thought, that sounds really cool. I'm going to learn all about him and uh, talk about him. Uh, so I ordered a book on Amazon, it's really long, <laughs> and uh, tried to read it. Um, and uh, so what I have to report today, um, I'm sorry to say, is that what I found when I tried to learn about Del Sart is that his technique is really strange and hard to understand. Um, so I was kind of like, oh my God, what have I got myself into? So, but I will uh, do my best today to explain to you all what I was able to learn about him and his technique um, and give you just a little taste of it. So, okay, so that, that's him. He's a pretty complex looking guy. You see some real emotional depths in, in that face. Uh, and before I keep talking about him, I actually want to step back a little bit um, and talk about how the book that I bought kind of came into existence. So Del Sart um, had a, what in the book is referred to as his protege, whose name was Steele McKay. Um, you see his dates there. Uh, he was an American actor, playwright, and author. Um, uh, who lived in France and studied with Del Sartre when he was around in his late 20s. Um, and he sounds like a really interesting guy, Steele McKay, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, according to what I read, he founded the first school of acting in the US and was responsible for over 100 theatrical inventions, including flame-proof curtains, folding seats, and something called the nebulator, which sounds like a sort of early fog machine type of thing. So the next time you go to the theater and put your seat down, you can think of Steele McKay. So he uh, studied with Del Sartre himself. And after he came back to the US, he met a young actress named Genevieve Stebbins, um, who was about 20 years younger than he was. And they were in a play together in New York when she was a young woman. And she met him and learned about Del Sartre and learned the technique from him and uh, became a very well-known uh, teacher um, and author of the technique. And uh, she's the person that actually wrote this book. So the point of this is all to say that uh, from reading it, I don't feel like I really know what Del Sartre himself believed or thought or had to say. The information in this book is third hand. So I think that's just worth saying. Um, but she seems like a really interesting person to study in her own right. Uh, she apparently developed this thing called harmonic gymnastics. And in what I read, I found a link um, to the 20th century American modern dance movement. Um, so I, I think that would be pretty interesting to learn more about. Um, but anyway, so back to Del Sartre himself. Uh, he was born in 1811, he died in 1871. Um, he was from the very far north of France. And uh, I just have some quotes from the book in here to give you an idea of the kind of language that Genevieve Stebbins wrote in. Uh, for want of, he moved to Paris at age 22 to study voice, but quote, for want of proper guidance, he lost his voice. Finding himself thus in incapacitated for the stage, he resigned that career for that of a teacher of singing and the dramatic art. 
Realizing he had been shipwrecked for want of a compass and pilot, he determined to save others from his fate by seeking and formulating the laws of an art hitherto left to the caprice of mediocrity or the inspiration of genius. <laughs> so again, I bought this book, I tried to read it, and like this is the style that it's written in, and it's just really impenetrable. Um, so, but what I was able to understand is that he wanted to uh, sort of codify human movement and he believed that certain parts of the body and the way we move are connected to certain um, kind of aspects of the human condition and the way people think and, and feel. Uh, and he kind of, or she makes, uh, Stebbins makes the point in the book, other artists study technique, so why shouldn't actors? There's kind of a belief out there that acting is just a gift and you either have it or you don't have it and you get up on stage and you're a good actor or you're not. So I think what um, Del Sartre and, and Genevieve Stebbins were kind of fighting against was that idea and uh, wanted to put out there the idea that just like any other artist, uh, there's a technique uh, to acting that you can study and learn. Um, so uh, one of the first things I uh, found in, uh, there's a chapter in the book called Decomposing Techniques. And I was able to get through that chapter, I understood what was being said, uh, it was very, the exercises described there are very familiar to me from exercises that I learned, uh, what we would have called it in my acting training is um, like relaxation technique. So he describes a technique that looks like this, where you stand like this, and Joint by joint, you relax your body. So first your fingers, then your wrists, then your elbows, then your arms, then your shoulders, then your head, and gradually roll your spine down and back up. And uh, the idea, I think, with that kind of exercise is to relax the body. Uh, as humans, we all have our natural habits in our body, places where we carry tension, like I carry tension in my shoulders a lot. Many people carry tension in their jaw or their um, head. And as an actor, you have to release all of that and kind of make your body a neutral space so that you can consciously choose to take on um, motions and habits of another character's body. So, uh, so those are the decomposing techniques. Uh, those, those were fun to read about. Then I got to this uh, chapter called The Principle of Trinity, and this is where things really started to kind of, <laughs> where I started to lose uh, my grip on what she was trying to say. So this is what I was able to get. Uh, Del Sartre um, divided motion into these three categories. Motion away from your center, he called eccentric, as in like this. Motion towards your center, he called concentric motion. And a uh, motion that would be in balance between the two, uh, he called normal. And you'll see the way he starts to combine those um, three different terms. And he connected what he called normal uh, motion with the torso, which kind of makes sense. That's sort of the center of your body. Uh, the concentric motion, um, he connected with your head. And eccentric motion, he connected with limbs. And at the same time, they're drawing this same kind of parallel connection between these different sort of states of mind, or whatever you might call it. Our moral life, our mental life, and what he called our vital or emotional life. So. Um, our torso, he connects with our sort of uh, essential life and moral life, and that kind of makes sense, right? We talk about our heart, what we feel in our heart. Um, the head, he, he associated with reason or in our mental life. Also, that's fairly in intuitive, right? Um, and then finally, the limbs, he uh, connected with emotion and um, what we called, he called our vitality. Okay, so then he took these three things and he kind of multiplied them by each other and he came up with this chart um, in which each state is multiplied either with itself or with one of the other states. Uh, so we have mento mental action, which is like head times head, uh, which he calls concentro-concentric. When you combine the moral with the mental, you get normo, concentric, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so I like to kind of try to imagine these young women at this school who were, what, 18 to 20 or so, um, trying to sort of process this. Um, 
But for a young actor, it's very comforting to believe that you can learn how to move your body a certain way and that will make you a good actor. Um, the truth is you need the physical training and to do the emotional work. Okay, so in this book, there's a chapter for every part of the body, a chapter for the head, a chapter for the legs, hands, etc., etc. And he has these charts uh, for each part of the body um, that's based on the charts that I showed in the previous slide. So what he was trying to, again, codify these m motions and explain that you would sort of tilt your head um, in a certain way to express a certain thing. So in the book, and I'll just read it a little bit, he puts into words what he's trying to show in this, this chart. So uh, normal, normal action, he says, signifies calm repose or indifference. And the action described would be that the head is level between the shoulders, inclined neither to the right or, nor the left, up nor down. So normal, as I said, kind of balanced between two different kinds of motion. That's just your head being still. Uh, concentric normal, so towards the body combined with um, a neutral space, signifies trust, tenderness, sympathy, affection, and esteem from the soul. The de description of the action is that the head leans towards the object, but n must not be raised, depressed, or rotated. And that continues. There's a description like that for all of those pictures. So um, uh, when we get to the end, I'll sort of bring it back to earth a little bit. But I think it makes sense to a point, but it seems like he's trying to parse it into such tiny increments that it sort of loses its meaning. What I do with my little guy? Oh, was that my last slide? It was. Okay. <laughs> Uh, great, so um, we're going to hold for questions later. Um, if you guys have any questions about this, I can try to answer. But the flyer did say that I would do a demonstration, and there is um, a nice little um, a series of exercises in the book that kind of works well for that. So this is a series of lines. They're all from the same play, and uh, he tells you what gesture to do uh, with each line. So I will do those gestures. There are. I think 15 or so, we won't do quite all of them. Um, and what I would like you to do is, if you believe me, raise your hand. If you don't, don't, okay? Is it okay for me to turn this like this? Oh, and you need me to spotlight myself, no? Okay. Like so? Okay. There's a fearful thought. I will not entertain so bad a thought. O oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Thank you. <laughs> Deny thy father. I shall forget to have thee still stand there, knowing how I love thy company. A thousand times good night. <laughs> well, Juliet, I will lie with thee tonight. Let's see for means. <laughs> I do remember an apothecary. Uh, let's skip a little here. To live an unstained wife to my sweet love. <laughs> I'm going to end with that one. I think that's about as good as it gets. Um, so uh, yeah, so to an extent, like as an actor, some of those, you know, you could do worse, but then some of them are like, place your head at the back of your head, and it's all kind of supposed to be based on this idea that when we're thinking, we use our head, we move with our head, and when we're emotional, we move with our limbs, and um, when we're feeling moral and central, we, maybe we stay still and focus on our torso. So um, that's what I was able to get for you guys about Del Sartre.
And again, just think about these girls learning, learning this and trying to apply it to their plays. Thank you. Back to Chris. Oh, and this was a um, slide that I had from the last uh, presentation on Delsart, and it shows some of these arm movements um, and some of these um, emotional states like um, supplication, the arms in this position, and worry and doubt and that sort of thing. So, um, okay, so on to uh, student dramatics. Um, I had a section last time where I talked about two different students who had participated to a large extent in a lot of plays um, and um, dramatic readings. And so I've continued that with another student from 1939, Dolores Stork. And here she is um, on pages of the ACORN, which was the yearbook uh, from National Park College, which is what it was called at the time. And um, she was listed in this photograph. It was a page of, I think, six different photographs um, <clears throat> of um, students who were the beauties of National Park College. So not a term that would probably be used today. They would make it probably more neutral. But anyway, she was uh, the most versatile in this. And the other students here, um, yeah, there were six others, most beautiful, most versatile, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but to go back to Dolores Stork, and I realize I don't have a computer up here with all my notes that I had about Dolores, but there's a, uh, out in the vitrines, the, the cases out in the hallway, uh, one of the cases has been devoted to um, Storky, as she was known to uh, her fellow students at the time. Um, uh, there's a, most of what I'm showing here is also to be seen um, for real out there in the, in the case. Uh, but she was the daughter of, um, forgotten his name, I think it was also Charles Stork, who was one of the founders of the National Football League. Um, and in fact was president um, from 1939 to 1941. Um, she, upon graduation, went to work in New York, met her future husband. Um, he proposed to her on Valentine's Day in 1947. Um, because of that, she then became known to her family and friends from that era as Val. So she was Val to them and Storky to everybody um, who was here at the seminary. And then later on she became um, very involved in the Alumni Association and was president, I think vice president, secretary, and treasurer at various times throughout the, her career. And she passed away in 2010. Um, but here is, um, the other thing to say about her is she, she was in at least six plays um, in 1939 and 38, and did at least four different uh, recital um, performances, including this um, final graduation recital uh, in May of 1939, uh, where she talked, uh, it, it was um, excerpts from Thornton Wilder's Our Town. And believe it or not, that's approximately when Our Town was written. It hasn't been in existence for a thousand years, like it seems. Um, it was written and performed on Broadway in 1937. And that tended to be a theme for most of the dramatic performances here at the seminary that they were um, effectively done within a year or two of their being premiered on Broadway. Um, so apparently they had a lot of money here, obviously they did, to um, pay all of the, the fees to do all of these performances. So this is a list of all of the um, various things she participated in during her final two years, um, Stage Door, play by uh, George Kaufman and Edna Ferber, um, play called Call It a Day, and all of these, by the way, were made into movies uh, within a year or two of their performances on Broadway, which meant that the movie came out either the same year they were performed here at the seminary or within um, or actually the year before in most cases. The only one of these I know that was not ever made into a movie was this Moon Over Mulberry Street. And again, I've lost my notes, so I can't actually tell you what all these were about. Um, Call It A Day was the uh, day in the life of a family in London, 
and the movie starred um, Olivia de Havilland. Um, this movie called Double Door um, was uh, kind of a murder mystery, well not quite, but it was a thriller at least, and she portrayed the um, eldest sister of a family of three in this New York mansion um, who had completely thwarted all of her sister's, younger sister's plans for romance and was working on her brother's uh, romances and in fact uh, the end of the movie, the climax of the, of the play, the movie, was her locking her brother's fiance into the family vault um, and you know, no air, no light and she was about to die and the fiance comes in at the last second and rescues her and of course um, she herself then gets locked in the vault as the play closes. So. Um, but it was made into a movie, and I can't remember who is in it, but it's, anyway, it was famous stars of the day. Um, you Can't Take It With You also, she starred in, and The Star Wagon. And The Star Wagon is um, a time travel sort of um, play. And there, again, is um, Stage Door. And all of these were done within about a 12-month period. So she was, I'm not really sure when she had time to do any kind of um, <laughs> schoolwork because she was constantly practicing all of, or for all of these plays. Um, and in this particular one, um, she was, as well as portraying uh, Mrs. Orcutt, she was also the stage manager for this play. Um, and this is the page from the yearbook of that year, 1939. Uh, she was vice president. Uh, here she is in her white dress again. And they had um, four productions, at least they talked about, um, in the uh, yearbook, Stage Door, Star Wagon, and Double Door. And there she is playing the matriarch, or the, I guess, eldest sister in the family, um, played... Um, also the lead in the Star Wagon, which is the one um, about the time traveler. And these are three um, different um, uh, dramatic readings that she participated in, the Students of Expression, um, they were called, and um, recitals, and um, she was uh, present in all of those, and this was over a period of about um, 10 months that she did all these culminating then a final month later with her graduate recital in, in May of 39. So again, she really didn't have time to do much of anything else, it seemed. Um, and last time I didn't have much time to talk about music, so I will briefly talk about that. Um, the Faculty of Music, unlike the other departments, um, they had both group classes and individual study for almost everyone. Uh, the private lessons, practice time, supervision, special events, etc. Um, unlike the other um, courses that were offered at the school, the faculty of music changed much more frequently than other departments. Um, there was one particular family, the Casper family. Um, between one and four members of that family was on staff from the beginning of the school until 1931. Uh, but by and large, um, there was someone new almost every year teaching something in music. And probably that's because there were uh, other sources of income for these teachers. They could get private lessons um, or give private lessons um, at their, from their homes. Um, they also were performing a lot. Some of the um, teachers on the staff uh, were Broadway um, singers and or metropolitan opera singers who would come in for a year or two and teach. Um, and there were also at the time lots of other schools that were in need of uh, teachers of music. Um, and the other thing that happened here was if you look through the catalogs from the beginning, from 1894 until the close of the school, you see certain names pop in and out. So they'll be here for a year or two, go away, uh, come back again and teach another year or two, so. And the performance schedule for uh, music, um, there were different events, there were faculty recitals, student recitals, and then uh, the student plays. And just from these, sort of comparing the early part of the school to sort of a, about a 10 or 15 year period later, uh, faculty recitals stayed more or less the same throughout the year. 
um, they didn't actually start or continue to report this in the um, catalogs. All of this information I got out of the school catalogs. Um, and, and for student recitals, uh, voice instrument, dance, and choir, um, in 1910-11, there were about 23. And in 23-24, there were slightly fewer. Um, student plays stayed pretty constant throughout the entire period of the school, about 10 to 11. And these included um, not only plays that happened in the Odeon Theater, but also plays that happened in the various sororities. So um, most of the sororities would put on some sort of event every year. And in most cases, those were plays as well. And um, this is a flyer from um, one of the St. Cecilia Chorus performances that was done um, in 1924, um, Spring Music Festival, also sort of co coinciding with the end of the school year. And it's one of those things where um, this isn't, I think I have another one that I show later on, but effectively this is a, um, uh, kind of a catch-all. I think most, uh, probably at least half the students in, this, in the student body participated in, in this chorus. Um, and if you look at the numbers, they sang about 10 pieces. And if you average that out to about three to four minutes a piece, that's close to 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and we're talking about, if you look at the numbers of people who are participating, um, it tended to run about half the student body as, you know, over, over the years. So um, I'm assuming it was one of those things that was more or less uh, a requirement if you didn't have any other kind of music um, performance in your uh, curriculum. And this is a photograph here in the ballroom taken uh, for a Christmas performance. Um, there are the members of the choir. There's also an, an orchestra in the front, which turns out is all male except for the woman at the piano. And in the back, um, there's also, I can't figure out what that is. They may actually be um, male choristers, of course, not attending the school, but from some other location. And then the audience here, and then there are also people up here in the, in the balconies, the uppermost balconies here uh, watching the performance. And again, another um, program from the Easter Vesper service. And some of the performer, or the uh, people who are performing music here are faculty members, and some of them are students. One of the uh, faculty members is Prosper Moralia, who was the harp uh, teacher uh, for several years here. And then the second recital, um, this is also uh, 1924 in the, in the fall, and again, these are individual student performances. And then for dance, um, there was um, not much by way of dance, at least for the theater performances and for the uh, dramatic readings. Um, we have at least um, uh, plays that we can refer to. These are all published plays and, and published readings that they had, but as far as dance goes, all we really have are these programs and the names of the dances. Um, so there's not much to go on in terms of, of history here. Um, this woman, Florence Schofield Young, um, was for a very long time the, the primary dance teacher at the school and appears um, for, for many years um, in, the, in, the, um, in the catalogs. But just to give you an idea um, of what went on, it was several students. Um, and some of these titles here, dances from many countries, the first one here is Persian slave dance. So again, a little <laughs> not quite PC for, for today. Um, Holland children, Spanish beauty, way of Peking. Um, and I love this name, Sybil Newt was her name. Um, but yeah, it, involved um, lots of students, and some of these names um, appear over and over again. So uh, last lecture I talked about Alita Esch, who was the star of um, the play um, Smiling Through, which will actually be showing from movie night uh, this coming October. Uh, and it starred, um, oh, 
I can't remember. Yes, thank you, Jeanette McDonald, right, right. Yeah, and there were actually three different filmings of Smiling Through. There's a 20s version, a 30 or 40s version, and then a late 40s version of that. So uh, we'll show the most recent one <laughs> from, the, from the 40s. And then I should mention while I'm here, um, there is at least one um, actor alumna, uh, Margaret Keys Lindsay. She was Margaret Keys um, here at school. And here is a graduation recital um, showing her uh, Margaret Keys as a reader. This was uh, students of, of, a, um, of, of uh, expression again. Um, and so they had, uh, she had two readings um, in, this, in this program. Oops, and oh, she'll go back. And this is what she's basically known for. Um, she starred with Vincent Price. This is Margaret Keys here. And Vincent Price um, starred in The House of the Seven Gables. And that was shown also for our movie night a couple of years ago. So I'll just quickly go through this. Um, the display cases that we have out of the hallway are new. Uh, we had earlier, uh, our first display was about Helen Froelich Holt, who was um, a teacher here at the school before getting married to uh, Senator Rush Holt um, and having a political career after that. Uh, but she, her estate gave us money to purchase these cases, so that was our first display, was about um, Helen Holt herself. And then our second display is now on um, the performing arts. And so just to show you what's in the case, uh, I talked about this last time. This is the infamous um, Natoma, which is an opera uh, that had a premiere, a disastrous premiere on Broadway, sorry, at the Met. But nonetheless, um, and it was on the, on the ver repertory of the Chicago Opera for three years, I think, but it was considered to be a really pretty lousy opera. Um, nonetheless, we have a nice uh, program from that, and this is Mae Little, who was uh, the star. It it's, um, takes place in, the, in Spanish California, as it says, uh, performed in 1913. And the interior, which you can't see, I, the only thing that's open, we only have room, we only have one copy of it. So this is what we have out in the case, but this is the interior of the, um, of the program. And Emma Ostrander, I talked about last time, she was one, one of the dramatic arts teachers, but she was also uh, important in the um, women's suffrage movement and participated in one of the large um, demonstrations that took place here in Washington um, in, the, in, the, um, in the teens and 20s. And I talked about Mildred Clisby last time, but I put the photograph out. She was the star of Hamlet. Um, and here's a list of the characters and the performers for that. Um, skip over that and go to this fantastic photo of Mildred Clisby as Hamlet, which is out there in the case to go look at. Um, she um, actually came back to the school at one point for I think a year and taught dramatic arts um, after graduating and then moved to Indianapolis. And uh, I think she was married to a lawyer and there's some record of her having participated in um, another play um, many years later, probably 20 years later or so. But that's kind of the last I've been able to um, uh, find out about her. And some scenes from that, from Hamlet. So obviously big production values they had and lots of money to spend on all these sets and costumes. And then the last one, which I didn't talk about last time, is The Sorcerer, um, Gilbert and Sullivan Opera. Um, cast of thousands, basically, a large chorus, um, and a really nice cast photo, which is out there in the case as well, but yeah, showing just, just tons of people start in, or were, were participating in this. And so thank you um, very much.